Hi, I'm Lynn Dyer. Welcome to the Armor and Cavalry Museum Restoration Shop. As Germany attacks into Poland in 1939, the development of their panzer divisions will dictate what the medium tanks and light tanks that America will develop will turn into. In the 1930s, we had developed the M2 series medium tank and M2 light tank. Behind me is the M2A1 medium tank system. It was going to be the primary vehicle in the tank battalions with three companies and then one company of light tanks being the long-term goal. As the war in Europe developed, they very quickly found that it had inadequacies that had to be taken advantage of and improved upon. Mostly, they found that the number of machine guns on the vehicle were considered excessive. The M2 medium actually carried a total of nine machine guns on her, which is part of her infantry support role element. The 37 millimeter in the revolving turret had the primary purpose of engaging and destroying most light and medium tanks of the day. If they encountered a heavy tank, then the tank would not have that capability of defeating it. But for the most part, the vehicle actually proved to be mechanically extremely reliable with the radial engine system that they had in the vehicle. Speed approximately 24 miles per hour, so it was relatively quick for its time period, and it did have a very high silhouette, which they feared was a bit of a problem as they watched the development of the war and started to realize, especially with the Panzer IV, that it had a short-barreled 75 millimeter, the gun system at some point in time would need to be improved and that would lead to future development of vehicles. The primary focal point on the M2, though, is going to be its track and suspension system on its chassis, the layout of the engine, the drive shaft, and a front transmission that will become the foundation for most of the primary vehicles used in World War II by the American Armored Forces. Most of the M2s were used stateside in training maneuvers all throughout the country, with the most famous, of course, being the Louisiana maneuvers in 1940 and 41, in which the vehicle was supporting the Army maneuvers to see how well we were prepared to deal with the entire World War II episode. During the actual maneuvers, the United States Army used this vehicle extensively, but the M2 medium is not a combat veteran. She was only a stateside piece that was used mostly for training, mostly before the war, and then after the war kicked on, it was still used as a driver trainer component, as far as that goes. The most significant improvement over the earlier vehicles used from the World War I time period is the fact that it's got a revolving turret up on the top. The revolving turret allowed the gun system to fire in 360 degree locations, allowing it then to engage targets. Now with the machine gun systems, they could also simultaneously engage other targets in different locations. The sponsor systems actually allowed the machine guns on either side to end up engaging literally 360 degree defensive elements to include even firing to the rear of the vehicle with armor plates to deflect the bullets backwards. Mostly though, it's gonna be the mechanical reliability of this vehicle, the revolving turret and the simplicity of maintenance it's gonna cause this vehicle to be a huge upgrade over the World War I vintage vehicles. The issue with the larger tanks like the British Mark V and the Mark VIII Liberty series was to deal with trench warfare. As vehicle development improved, they found that trenches could be dealt with using engineering assets that later on would be incorporated. Things like bulldozer blades and tank plows and rollers and even bridges and other items to actually breach those kind of things. Barbed wire was not becoming as much of an issue as it had been in the First World War. Even though vehicles still had problem with it, they could negotiate through those areas. The larger threat to most of these vehicles is going to be the introduction of the anti-tank gun systems that will be incorporated in the 1920s and 30s. There will always be a power struggle between the development of armor protection and the firepower that was trying to penetrate the armor. So through that time period, 
mostly the 20s is a time period where the anti-tank gun systems improved significantly and then in the 1930s the armor and the mobility countered that and allowed for the tanker to have a better chance of survival on the battlefield. The, the big thing is going to be in the First World War, the speed of the vehicles only being five miles per hour, they're very slow moving targets, very easy for a weapon system to be brought to bear against it. A faster moving vehicle is harder to hit, especially when the commanders are a little better trained because of peacetime training environments and also paying attention to what's going on in the rest of the world and learning lessons from what the Japanese are doing as well as the Germans with their tank forces. Beside me is an M2A3 light tank. It is in one sense a little bit the epitome of what an infantry support tank is. It is light, it is mobile, but the primary weapon systems on her are machine guns. As you can end up noting, she's got a 50 cal that gives her some degree of anti-armor capability, but the primary weapon stations, whether the bow mount machine gun positions or up in the top, are mostly manned with a 30 caliber machine gun. Note that this does not have a single turret. She carries two turrets. Her nickname back in the day was a Mae West, with her ability to end up engaging multiple targets in different directions simultaneously, but with her light speed and her capabilities, a very maneuverable vehicle. The M2 series will morph through several different versions and eventually the M2A4 will become the last of its series and it becomes then the M3 series Stuart tank used in World War II. The vehicle's engine system is a radial engine just like the medium tank had, giving it a very high power to weight ratio and actually a speed of almost 40 miles per hour. So back in the day, she was a very, very quick vehicle, used a lot for screening, reconnaissance type missions, but she is primarily an infantry type support tank as her primary mission. Four man crew, a driver, a bow mount machine gunner, and then a commander, generally in the 50 caliber turret, and then a, another gunner in the coax uh, system in the other turret system. This vehicle was introduced in 1935 and it was used all the way up until 1940 as a primary training vehicle. Most of the 1920s and 30s vehicles started developing the multi-turreted systems to allow them to engage targets in multiple different locations, a little bit like a land ship design concept. That's one of the innovative ideas that came forward with this particular vehicle. Part of the problem they had, though, is if the turrets are operating against each other, where they're both trying to end up going and engaging a target in a different direction other than straight front, the individuals inside sometimes had issues with the turret system locking up and having other small problems. But as far as a vehicle that would be able to providing some degree of supporting fire and infantry support, it's a very capable vehicle. Behind me is an M3 Stuart. It is a mid-production Stuart tank, not the earlier version with the hexagon turret, and it's depicted actually with the oval-shaped cupola on the top of the turret system. The turret also is horseshoe in shape versus hexagonal, which the earlier model is. It is a development from the M2 series, specifically the M2A4. The gun system originally is exactly the same gun system, mount, and sight system. These early vehicles have a four-man crew, weigh approximately 15 tons for the vehicle, have a speed of around 40 to 42 miles per hour, and it is a light reconnaissance type tank. Now used extensively in North Africa as a reconnaissance vehicle, used in the Italian campaign, and also used extensively in the Pacific theater by both Marine Corps and Army units. The vehicle is very mobile and against the Japanese Type 95 tanks, it was a very capable vehicle on the battlefield. 37 millimeter main gun is its primary weapon system. She carries approximately 183 main gun shells so she can stay in a fight for quite a while. This particular model happens to be a Guyberson diesel element. The diesel engines were usually used as lint lease pieces going to Great Britain, going to Russia, supporting the French and also the Marine Corps units as well. The vehicles 
as they are employed as part of that light unit or part of a tank battalion. The tank battalion consists generally of three medium tank units and then a light tank like the Stuart. The Stuart was designed to counter the German Panzer IIs and early Panzer III's with its capabilities on the European theater. As such, she had firepower dominance over the Panzer II. But the Panzer III morphs through its evolution with the short barrel 37 millimeter, which was equal to what 37 millimeter the Stuart carries, and eventually had a long barreled 50 millimeter on her, as well as additional armor protection while as the Stuart stopped the development process as far as it goes. As a lint lease piece, the Brits using this vehicle extensively in North Africa is where the Stuart first gets its reputation as a good platform against the German Panzer II. The British will end up using this in combat for actually a full year before America starts truly getting involved in the war effort. So that combat experience and lessons learned by the British will actually be instrumental into the development of the future light tanks as well as its capability and its tactics on how it's employed. The German Panzer II as a reconnaissance vehicle generally had a tendency of avoiding combat, especially against heavier armored vehicles, and its 20 millimeter had enough capability to protect the vehicle against thin-skinned vehicles, but whenever she encountered a heavier vehicle that she usually would use her size and her stealth and her mobility to get out of the combat fight and report back. The design element with the horseshoe shape was actually easier for production of the vehicle than the hexagon plate. It's a single piece metal plate that is looped into a horseshoe shape versus being dependent upon individual welding. It's also increased in thickness as far as the steel plating providing a bit more ballistic protection from the inside. The tank also does not have a turret basket, so the four-man crew have to work around the drive shaft element that's associated with it. But the tank has a couple other unique features. She does not have a gyro stabilizer, so she's not a very accurate moving shooting platform. But with the free gun capability of the tank, the tank actually was fairly accurate against moving targets by the gunner manipulating the tank. As I demonstrate with the gun barrel here, the turret is in a fixed position. But note, as I take the barrel and push it back and forth, this is part of that free gun capability that is designed into the tank's system. You have a driver who's located right through here. He controls the driving. His instruments are right through the front. You've got a bow mount machine gun operator who will operate the bow mount machine gun and operate the radio if the vehicle does have one at that point in time. For the turret basket system that does not exist, the crew has to step over the internal drive shaft system and back and forth as the turret traverses. Commander is on this side, and then the loader is on this side. So in this particular case, the commander is also the gunner on the vehicle. The vehicle's primary improvements are thicker armor protection. It's got a better ground contact surface area than the M2 by taking and adjusting the compensating idler wheel at the rear of the vehicle down onto the ground, giving it better ability to climb over objects and as far as stability when she is driving. But the engine, the transmission, and the basic whole shape are the same between the M2 series and the M3 series. Beside me is an M3 A3 Lee tank. It's a medium tank based upon the development from the M2 series medium tank that we talked about earlier. This vehicle incorporates the same chassis and suspension system as you can see within the track design elements and the similarity between them. Small modifications within the track, the road wheel, support rollers were adjusted as lessons learned from experience on the maneuvers. Engine system on these vehicles varied. Several of the different M3s used everything from radial engines to diesel engines to, in some cases, some of the other modified engine and transmission systems. What makes the M3 unique is the fact that they attempted to provide anti-tank gun capability with the 37 millimeter in the top turret. But to provide infantry support and the realization they needed a larger caliber gun system to fight against like the German vehicles, 
they incorporated a 75 millimeter gun in a side sponset system. And that's what you're going to see on the right hand side of the tank. This happens to be an M2 75 millimeter with a counterweight at the end of the barrel to offset the breech block element inside. The gunner and the loader for that gun system sit on that side of the vehicle while up in the turret there is a gunner, a commander in a small cupola at the very, very top with a machine gun, and then the loader for the 37 millimeter. The driver sits up in the front over on the left hand side. Earlier versions actually had a seven man crew, not a six man crew, because there was additional machine guns up in front and a radio system there as well. The M3 is named by the Brits for General Robert E. Lee from the American Civil War. The focal point for this girl is that you're going to have Lee tanks used by the British in North Africa. The Brits, though, had a tendency of taking them, modifying them into a Grant series with a different turret and getting rid of that top cupola system, but the foundation for the Lee is basically the same. Americans will end up using this vehicle as part of the forces landing in Operation Torch, North Africa, November of 1942, and assault across part of northern Germany. The vehicle found to have several issues, a very high silhouette, which was one of the reasons why the Sherman's just a little bit shorter when they developed the rotation of the turret system on that particular vehicle. But for the most part, this vehicle as an interim tank was a relatively quick fix for the problem that the Americans needed until the Sherman could come along. But the foundation of this and the lessons learned in combat will be instrumental in supporting future development of the Sherman, the gun systems, and how the tank is tactically deployed on the battlefield. I'm standing in front of our German Panzer II Aust F light tank. Germany developed the Panzer II back in 1936 time period as a reconnaissance platform. When you look at the development of the tank corps for the German Panzer Force, their Panzer I's were trainers, their Panzer II's were considered as a reconnaissance platform, their Panzer III's were their primary tank killing weapon system, and the Panzer IV intended for infantry support. The weapon systems that they actually have will be based upon that requirement. So when you look at the Panzer II, she is armed with a 20 millimeter cannon. The cannon has good anti-armor capability against light-skinned vehicles, but her intent as a reconnaissance vehicle is to use stealth, small size, and quick mobility to get into a good position to observe the enemy and report back with its radio capability for the heavier armor force to develop the fight. Now part of that in an offensive operation would be where she is leading that offensive fight, trying to find seams within the enemy's positions and then taking those to her advantage. She does not want to become decisively engaged. This vehicle has barely three quarters of an inch of armor plating on any part of the vehicle and most of it is only a half an inch thick. So even small arms ammunition potentially can be a little bit of a threat to her Hence, she tries to avoid a fight. She has a three-man crew, a driver in the front, and then a commander who primarily is in charge of the 20 millimeter, and then an additional gunner who works the MG-34 coax machine gun system that's available to her. She weighs approximately five tons, and she has a road speed of right around 38 miles per hour with everything working perfectly. The Panzer II will develop through several different models from the beginning with the Aust A all the way through eventually something called a Lynx or a Lynx as far as its reconnaissance platform where they will add significantly more armor but still keep a small caliber weapon system. The vehicle is used extensively on the Eastern Front, North Africa, and in the Italian campaigns. But against the Americans generally it's only going to be in North Africa where we primarily encounter her. The American M3 Stewart is more than a match for the Panzer II. When you end up getting into Operation Overlord at the invasion of D-Day, the Panzer II for the most part is really relegated to a training vehicle and only to a few of the reconnaissance units by that point in time. 
This is solely recon, period. Not necessarily like a light tank would end up being. A light tank's purpose is a little bit different than a reconnaissance vehicle. Reconnaissance vehicles can be armored cars, they could be jeeps, they could be motorcycle type units, and the Germans used all of those extensively in addition to the little Panzer II. But up on the Panzer Division for most reconnaissance units early in the war, the Panzer II is their primary reconnaissance unit at that level. This vehicle is introduced back in 1936 during the colder time period when the war is not hot. And for the most part, there's several elements of the track and suspension system that have been improved, specifically using a light leaf spring suspension, which gave her good cross country capability, but small silhouette. For most of the individuals in this vehicle, if you're over five foot four, you're almost too big to be in a vehicle of this size. So it's an issue of size and weight being another issue. Generally about 125, 130 pounds at the most for the men fighting in this vehicle. Anything heavier than that, getting in and out of the hatches will be a little bit more of an issue. She's got a single six cylinder inline engine in the rear of the vehicle, giving it actually good propulsion and mobility cross country. Some of the other features that they dealt with, especially for the desert operation, is special filters for clean air going into the engines and the crew living in a desert environment were some of the early features they had to deal with. The vehicle does not have good ventilation but does have actually fairly decent observation with the multitude of different hatch systems that they have on it. The back hatch system here, while it is part of what's used for vehicle maintenance, is also a rear escape hatch system which is kind of a novel idea that if the vehicle does get compromised and put out of action, the crew can use the vehicle as armor protection to escape out the back and hopefully survive. Germany, like every vehicle producing country during that time period, they were looking at what every other country was doing. Specifically, the Germans were looking at what the British were developing within their vehicles, a little bit with the Russians. America, we really didn't have much on the plate at that point in time. Germany, though, will develop what they see their tactical requirements are, but I would say specifically it's probably more the British development of vehicles that will help to influence the German design development. Originally, when the Panzer II, the Panzer I's, and Panzer III's are introduced in September of 1939 going into Poland, they have a Panzer gray base color on them. Later on, especially as you start getting into North Africa, Italy, and into Russia, they will change the color to a color called Dunkelgeld, which is a little bit of a mustard yellow brown color for that environment. It's trying to, in one sense, mimic some of the sand as well as the wheat field colors that you're going to find in the area like the Ukraine in Russia. And that will become the base color for almost all the rest of the German tanks throughout World War II. The vehicle you have before you right here is a German Panzer III Aust J. Originally, she started off as an Aust F. Over the course of time, because of military necessity, it was upgraded with additional armor plating and an upgun gun system. This is the primary vehicle that the German Wehrmacht planned on using against tank warfare. Originally with the 37 millimeter, like most of the nations, was an adequate weapon system. Over the course of time, though, Heavier vehicles like were encountered in France and then later on in Russia required that substantial more powerful gun systems were installed as well as in other cases thicker armor to enhance the survivability of the vehicle. The Panzer III has a crew of five weighing between 16 to 18 tons originally and then slowly increases as inch thick armor plating is added to the frontal armor components. Now later on also some of those elements will include side armor using a standoff against anti-tank rifles. It does have some capability against chemical energy type of weapons later on that would be employed, but those become standard features for later model vehicles. This particular vehicle has a 50 millimeter L60 long barreled main gun. Originally this vehicle was intended to take on the T-34-76 version of the Russian medium tank and in some cases it actually is a very capable vehicle in encountering those. 
Additional armor protection is also provided by adding additional track block sections to the front of the vehicle. The extra track forms additional armor, but its primary purpose is as replacement track for the vehicle as the vehicle moves and wears out its primary track. The crew will also carry additional fuel cans, spare parts like additional road wheels, and other highly consumable elements on the outside of the vehicle. And as they place them on the vehicle, they will set them in such a configuration that they provide a little bit of additional ballistic protection for the crew inside. Five-man crew with the driver sitting over through here, transmission in the front, bow mount machine gun operator. Gunner will be over on the left-hand side of the gun with the loader here and the commander centrally located behind the main gun system. The tank also incorporates a combination of internal sight systems but backup mechanical sight systems. If you look back at the cupola in front of the driver's vision periscope, you'll see a blade sight used for alignment of the main gun and a backup gunnery system as far as that goes. The vehicle also incorporates a full set of escape hatches or hatch systems for every crew member which is definitely a good thing if the vehicle ever gets damaged. With the turret for the loader and the gunner, there is a side hatch system. The commander has his own hatch. What's unique on this is there's no hatches here in front of the driver or the bow mount machine gun operator, but if you look in between the track on the side, you will find an escape hatch or an entry hatch on both the left and the right hand side for these individuals to end up getting out. So if a vehicle is compromised, everybody's got their own hatch. They practice the escape and evacuation drills out of this particular vehicle. If you compared the Panzer III against the M3 Stewart with the 37 millimeter that she's originally armed with, they're on an equal playing level as far as both firepower and armor protection. Now later on, as the Panzer III is upgunned and armed with a thicker armor, she eventually has a better ballistic capability of surviving a hit from a Stuart and also taking out a Stuart with a larger caliber gun system and the thicker armor to prevent it. When the American Sherman comes along, the Sherman is a bit more of a match for the Panzer III with its 75 millimeter gun, as well as the M3 Lee with her cannon systems that she has capable as far as that goes. Towards the latter part of the war, the Panzer III is phased out as a primary tank versus tank weapon system. She is still very capable of taking on light tanks or lightly armored vehicles like the personnel carriers, self-propelled artillery pieces, and those types of vehicles. But the modification of the German vehicles has now shifted in the latter part of the war from the Panzer III up to the Panzer IV as the primary tank killing weapon system and then later on the Panther and eventually up to the Tiger level. Panzer III is a very good success story for the Germans, mostly during the war years, during the early years as a tank, and then later on as she gets into 1943 and 44-45, they convert her over to a Stug III, where they take away the top of the turret, adjust the superstructure, and put a German 75 millimeter pack anti-tank gun type system as her primary weapon system. That vehicle, while it is also in production at the same time period in 1939 and 40, has a short barreled 75 millimeter gun system. The Stug 3 is a phenomenal weapon for both infantry support, also listed as a tank killing weapon system, and also other types of support roles that that vehicle is capable of. The major difference is the turret here can traverse 360 degrees. The Stug's gun system is limited to a left and right of about 15 degrees left and 15 degrees right. I'm Lynn Dyer. Thank you for stopping by the Armor Restoration Shop. Until next time.